So welcome everyone to the first installment of our UC Agriculture and Natural Resources webinar series on integrating livestock into orchard and vineyard systems. My name is Sonia Broads and my work focuses on improving the environmental health of agriculture at the UC Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, which is one of the statewide programs of UC Agriculture and Natural Resources or UCANR for short. This is the land grant and outreach and extension arm of the University of California system. First, before we go anywhere, I'd like to thank Paulina Binsveld, our summer intern, visiting from Wageningen University in the Netherlands, who will be our facilitator today. And Paulina actually did the bulk of the creative work and the nuts and bolts organizing work to get this webinar series going. And I also want to thank my two other UCA and our colleagues, Rebecca Osran and Jackie Beck. I want to mention also that the second webinar in the series will be taking place on Tuesday, August 16th at 6.30 in the evening Pacific time. So today's webinar is focusing more on the production practices and the agroecology side of things. And then that next webinar on August 16th We'll focus more on the logistics of contracting with livestock operations to come and graze in orchards and vineyards. So the registration link is the same for both webinars. So if you went through that to get on this webinar, chances are you're already registered for the second one and you'll be getting the information, uh, but we can also share that link later as well. So why are we talking about grazing in orchards? Diversifying our production systems is one of the most important things we can do to create healthy ecosystems on and off the farm and to boost resilience to disturbances, including things like climate change. I think this is something that traditional farmers and ranchers and indigenous land stewards understood since long ago, but our modern day industrialized systems have kind of lost sight of this and the importance of diversity for many different reasons, including that we're trying to mechanize the labor and, and different things like that. But I'm really excited to see that there are some of our colleagues, both in the farming world and in the research world, who are doing cutting edge work that frankly is mind blowing to me in terms of helping to renew this vision of diverse production systems. So in this webinar series, what we want to do is to create opportunities to exchange information from the field and from research, recognizing that both perspectives are equally important. And we are also hoping to create a community of practice around livestock integration in cropping systems in which producers, researchers, extension and agricultural professionals, and even policymakers can interact with each other and come together to make more progress in this arena. So I really, really thank our panelists today. We have two producers and three researchers for making the time to join with us and help us work towards these goals. Um, and I also actually want to Briefly mention that um, if you're interested in this topic and you're in the Northern California area or you can make it there, um, our team is also planning an in-person workshop on crop livestock integration to be held in Hopland in Mendocino County on Friday, September 2nd. We don't have any more information right now, but just hold that date and you'll get more information as the planning progresses. Um, so let's see, I wanna just go over a few quick housekeeping things here for um, webinar etiquette, if you will. So please stay on mute and with your camera off unless you are speaking. Um, if you're on the phone only, you join the meeting just on the phone, you can use star six to mute and unmute yourself. That's star six. Um, so what we'll be doing today is we'll first be hearing from our two producers on the panel, and then there'll be a short Q&A period, and then we'll hear from the researchers, and there'll be another extended question and answer period. So if you want to ask a question, there's two ways you can do so. Um, we encourage you to type into the chat, and we'll all be monitoring that for questions as we go along. Or you can also wait till the time period for the Q&A, and then you can raise your hand 
Um, and if you're on the computer, you do that by going to the reactions button at the bottom right of your screen and find a hand raising function. And if you're on the phone, you can raise your hand using star nine. Um, finally, we're just in a meeting mode and not a webinar mode. So if you want to see only the person currently speaking, you can go to the top right of your screen and find where it says view, and then you can change from gallery to speaker view. Um, if anybody wants to have um, a real time trend automatic transcription, you can go uh, as it shows on the screen to the more section at the bottom right and the uh, menu will pop up and you can choose the live transcript and, and click on there. Um, and also we're going to be doing a, a little poll. Uh, there's a link here in case you have trouble with pop up polls, you can go to that. So yes, while we're at it, let's go ahead and do the poll. We're very interested in knowing in our outreach efforts who we are reaching and um, whether we're achieving equity in our outreach. So please answer this poll and I assure you all the answers are completely anonymous. I'll give you just a minute for that. have everybody no we're still getting somewhere i'll just give the poll another oh okay it looks like we've ended it all right thanks everybody okay thank you great and with that i will turn it over to paulina to introduce our speakers Hi everybody, thank you for being here. Thank you, Sonia, for that introduction. Uh, like Sonia mentioned, we'll start with our producer panel and then get into some questions after that. So without further ado, our first speaker is Benina Montes from Burroughs Family Farms. Hi, thank you for having us. Go ahead and share my screen. So my name is Bonina and I'm a fourth generation farmer. Just gonna give you guys a quick little history. Um, my um, great grandfather started in the East Bay in 1906. Uh, and then in the early seventies, my grandfather and my parents found the current property that we're on. And we had dairy beef and, and crops for the dairy. And in 1988, we started our first, um, we planted our first almond block. So this is my great grandfather back in the day. And then this is my parents in college. And um, then I came back in 2002. And in 2006, we started our first transition into organic for the almonds. By 2015, we had the whole farm certified organic. And in 2022, um, we had um, four of our blocks that are, got certified regenerative organic through the Regenerative Organic Alliance. And we're one of the first almond farms in the world to get that. Um, grazing is, was, isn't something that we just started um, in the 80s and 90s. My parents um, used management intensive grazing on the beef cattle. My brother and sister each had pasture-based systems where they used the same thing. Um, and in, I don't remember which year, but as we moved to organic, there was just so much vegetation under the orchards. And um, so we were like, well, how can we utilize this as grass farmers? What can we do? So uh, a few times we did have yearling heifers um, graze and then occasionally we'll have the chickens go uh, go around there and we will use them in the young in the in the younger almond blocks where the egg mobile will fit but last year we added um about 700 ewes to graze in the almonds so here's pictures of the of the dairy cattle out on the pivots uh, 
uh, and they, you know, would go out in the morning and then come in. Um, and you can see on the right hand side, there's some of the heifers. You can vaguely see the, the hot wire fence that we use to keep them in. And uh, all of our hoses are up off the ground. So the sheep do really well with that. Here's the chickens in there. You can see that our coop is pretty high. So it doesn't fit down the tree rows of a uh, established orchard. But it does fit quite nicely when we have young trees and we plant cover crops. And um, as long as we're moving the coop through, um, the birds do a great job. If you leave them there too long, they will, they can do damage to the young trees. But this makes me smile the most having these guys out. Um, and it's just, it's just lovely to see. I mean, if that doesn't bring a smile to your face, I don't know. Um, this was some of our, our first flock. Uh, at the time, we wanted to make sure that the hot wire was working. You can see that there's three wires there. Um, but now, for the most part, we just use two. And depending on which flock, sometimes we'll even just use one. So you can see the difference they do. Um, and I mean, there's been times where we'll walk through after the sheep have been in there and it almost looks like they've mowed it, you know, they just do a really nice job. So a couple things that they wanted us to talk about were, were how we're selling things. So um, for our almonds and olive oil, they do, we can use the ROC trademark for that, but all of our lamb is mainly sold by trailer and truckloads, but we are um, selling some um, grass-fed direct to consumers. And one of our biggest benefit is just, just the magic that they're able to do um, with all the nutri nutrient cycling. Um, we're really excited to see how our soil health improves, um, how our organic matter continues to increase. With almonds, we're very cognizant of the amount of water that's used. So each, any increase in that just is amazing. So that when we do get excessive rainfall, you know, our soil can just hold that much more. And the other good thing is that we also can have the added income of, of selling the lamb off of there too. Um, we didn't mow in our existing orchards until I think like mid April this year. So, I mean, that took off a couple passes right there and everyone with the cost of fuel knows how awesome that was. Um, how are we on time, Paulina? I don't wanna go over it. No, you're, you're good to keep going, thanks. Okay, so we just kind of jumped in on this. And so they asked like what some of our key challenges were. Well, <laughs> um, we bit off we bit off a huge project uh, with 750 ewes that about a third of them were due in March, we were told, and then the rest were due in May. Um, they came, uh, the third of them were pretty heavy, um, heavy pregnant, uh, you know, they were late gestation. And so one lambed on the truck and then they just kept on lambing. So um, challenges that we've had for myself, having just done trees for the last 20 years, even though I grew up helping with animals, was um, knowing what the nutritional needs were and you know, depending on what age they are, making sure that we have enough feed year round for what their needs are. You know, even though it, it can be a beautiful thing, it has to make financial sense. Um, and then, you know, just figuring out how you're gonna keep records, how you're gonna sell them, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm gonna hold off on advice until later. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, we, we, like I said, we have had kind of three different modes in the orchards at time, young heifers, um, chickens, as well as sheep. Um, so happy to answer any questions, but, you know, we're learning as we go through and happy to share whatever we can help so that you don't have to face the similar challenges that we've had. But again, I really love that we have them and I'm excited to see how, you know, how we can get them grazing all year round instead of just for part of the year. Um, very interested in off the ground harvesting. I'm lo looking forward to hearing our next speaker and, and how they're, they're uh,
incorporating them into their orchard. Awesome, thank you, Vanina. Like, uh, like we're talking about, if you have any questions, just go ahead and drop them in the chat and then we can bring them up later so you don't forget them. Um, our next producer speaker is going to be Raquel from Masa Organics. Hello, everyone. Um, this is pretty cool. Uh, it was so great to meet you, Benina. And I was so um, excited to hear every time you would say, it just makes you smile because here I have the same picture. It's, I just, um, there's just uh, amazing beauty in having the animals mixed into the orchard. We have identical systems. Um, my livestock and orchard system is also almonds with um, sheep um, and um, but hopefully and, and we have a lot of the same challenges and um, I think we might have lost Raquel is that right everybody all right, well, let's give her a minute and pray for her yeah. life. Sometimes it's just momentary, but I don't know. Okay, I'm back. I have no idea how much I, I said or not. Um, Sonia, you said you were going to go straight to the video if, if you lost me. So, um, no, I think you should probably just start again from how this photo makes you smile. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, I just, um, I know um, a common spirit. I can, I can just tell. So I'm Raquel Kroc. Um, one of the owners and operators of Massa Organics. I'm also currently a graduate student working with Cindy Daly at Chico State um, uh, with a project on in our almond orchard. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other co-owner is my husband, Greg Massa. He's uh, where the name comes from. We uh, have a organic diversified farm, but our main crops are rice and um, almonds and then the sheep. He's a fourth generation rice farmer up here in the Northern Central Valley. Next slide, please. Um, I stuck these in here so you can see uh, where we're located. We're up in Glen County near Chico. Um, the photo on the right is, um, one is going facing south, one is facing north. Facing south, you can see we're right up against the Sacramento River. Um, and so we have really good water. We have groundwater. We also have some surface water. Um, on the left, the, there are, um, the, our rice ground is in the light green and then our 30 acres of almonds are the bottom uh, rectangle and that little triangle. Um, Overall, the ranch is about 250 acres and it includes like 50 acres or so that's uncultivated, which is includes um, borders, uh, field borders and some riparian habitat. And um, it's just kind of important to see how it all goes together because <laughs> like Benina said, there's a lot of the time where um, throughout the year where the sheep can't be in the orchard. Um, next slide. Uh, this is, these are a couple shots of what our system looks like. Uh, the top left is a picture of cover crops. We, um, we've had almonds, this orchard is about 17 years old and we had grown cover crops off and on until three years ago, we got a Healthy Soils grant to, to put in cover crops every year for the last three years plus compost, which you can see is being spread on the bottom. Um, we've had sheep since 2011. And um, 
brought them in as weed whackers and mowers, uh, basically from the beginning um, and our knowledge and understanding of how much bigger of an impact that they make, actually it has grown over, over the years. Um, as Benina pointed, uh, mentioned, we do um, our harvest, the bottom right photo, we harvest off the ground. Um, we have a permanent vegetative cover. We never till or spray or scrape or sweep. Um, when we were first starting, it was just to uh, shake the nuts on tarps, but we have used both this catching frame and then also this past year, we use prune um, harvesting equipment to catch the nuts. Uh, so they never reach the floor. Uh, the next slide, please. This is the video of, well, you can see what it is. That's, um, that's a video of the sheep leaving one pen that they've completely <laughs> um, eaten and going into a fresh new pen. We run about 125 sheep combination of ewes and lambs, depending on the time of the year. We tend to um, have about one acre size pens with that many sheep and they're in there for about 24 hours. And at the end of that, um, they're just ready to move on. So we can run our sheep through the orchard in about a month um, with one pass, basically. I think the next um, slide is helpful. Oh, next one. There you go. Put this on um, just, this is a, diagram of like the year of what it looks like um, with what's happening in the almond orchard. Um, so January, oh, we'll start at the bottom. We're in July. We're just getting ready to harvest. There's an exclusionary period where the, there can't be livestock in the orchard for 90 days before harvest. So the sheep are not in there. Um, once we harvest, we put them back in for a couple months, maybe a little less depending on the weather seed our cover crop in mid-October, pull the sheep out, leave them out while the cover crop is growing, establishing, just very slow in the winter. Depending on the, on the weather, the um, rainfall, we, and temperatures, of course, we try to get the sheep back in February at some point for about a month. It's basically one pass through, but then we pull them out and have them by the house. <laughs> so that we can do um, the lambing because um, even just 75 ewes lambing is exhausting and a lot of work. And so we have a lot better um, luck um, being more hands-on. So we keep them, we, we just lamb for about a month and then we put them in for a month back in the orchard. Cover crop is huge and beautiful. Pass them through one more time before then they come out um, for that exclusionary period again. Um, we, we end up mowing a little bit or quite a bit just at the very end before harvest, but that's pretty much the only time we ever mow, uh, in the orchard. Uh, next slide, please. So these are other photos of what it looks like, um, with them grazing. As you can see on the bottom right, their trampling does <laughs> more, I think, than just the grazing, um, and, and is also why the high density and the short periods in each um, pen are the way they are. They're, they're just there and then they're out. Uh, next slide. Just a couple shots because they're cute. Um, this is having the, the sheep when they're lambing by the house. Um, we also bale feed them while they, this year we had to leave bales out for them to feed as well because the because of the drought with very little feed. Um, this little bit of grass goes fast with that many sheep. Uh, next slide. 
And so these are a couple examples of our all of the alternatives um, for other times of the year where they can't be in the orchard. We do like on the bottom left, we grow cover crops on some of our other crop fields when we're not growing rice. And so we use those to graze and other times of the year, um, we feed a lot of hay if we've been able to bale. Uh, we have a lot of borders top left. Um, the picture on the top right is that we actually have a, a small mandarin orchard as well. And we took some of our sheep to uh, graze in that uh, orchard this last year too. So next slide. Similar to Benina's, <laughs> we, um, I don't know how much time you want me to spend. Um, people could see these later. Um, cost benefits, it's hard to come up for me, for us, for the economic value of this, um, because it's hard to measure that in, in soil health. Um, I, we've, we're thrilled that we use fewer fossil fuels, um, but it's hard to translate that into actual dollars at this point. Um, we're not losing money, but, um, but it's hard to put a value on it some of the time. Um, I think that that's my last slide. So I'll thank you for, um, and be happy to answer more questions later. Awesome, thank you, Raquel. Uh, so now we'll have about 10 minutes or so to answer some questions uh, from the producers. So if anyone wants to raise their hand and ask a question, now you're welcome to do so. Otherwise, I have some of uh, your questions that you sent in when you registered. So I can also step in and ask those, but I'll give you all a minute to, to raise your hand if you wanna ask a question. Nina. So, if you guys are harvesting off the ground, why do you not let the sheep in? That's still the policy. It's still not allowed. I'm blanking on the organization that monitors that, but it's still not. It's, it's, I disagree with the policy, but um, we do abide by it. And what is the machine that you're using to harvest? Uh, the, the one in the picture was, uh, what's it called? I forgot the name of it, but it, it basically is like an umbrella. It opens up and just hugs the tree, shakes it and it all lands in that upside down umbrella. Prune, um, I don't know if you can see my hands, prune, yeah. um, they're just flat and they, they go up against the tree and catch it and they all, it, it's prune harvesters are, it was amazing. It took two days to do the whole or three days to do the whole. Um, wow. We can talk off orchard last too, year. I was just, I'm yeah, really looking um, forward to, to finding something that will work for us. <clears throat> the, the first, the individual machine was very labor intensive, very slow. The prune um, harvesting, we contracted to bring that in and, and that was so fast and so, so much more efficient. Anyway, definitely. So um, here's one question for you that they have. Do you have to mow the cover crop during almond bloom and how will that affect the cover crop? Uh, we, we almost, we don't mow at all, all year until the very last minute before harvest so that the equipment can get through. Either it's growing too, more slowly or um, the sheep have eaten it all down. It doesn't have any effect on the bloom in February. Um, and then for our farm, we aren't mowing either. We're just letting the sheep go through. And I, I didn't mention this, but we're running in five acre groups and we're basically moving every other day. So the next question they have for you is when you say you run them on borders, does that mean hedgerows? Um, so mm. in rice production, uh, there's a lot of edges. And so no, they're not technically hedgerows that are um, more traditional. In my ex uh, experience, a hedgerow is more, um, got more things planted, more intentional, whereas our field borders are basically weeds, um, native plants, and then 
We have edges that um, are between fields, rice fields, but we also have the edges that are more riparian habitat. Yeah. So. And we have, um, we do have some hedgerows. We haven't put the sheep in there, but we have had them clean up um, some of like our riparian areas and some of our native ground. The next question they have is, have you encountered any copper toxicity from orchard sprays or and you, have you measured copper levels in forages? We have not that we know of. Um, when, we haven't measured for it. Um, I did have a forage analysis just done this spring and it did not include copper. So we were aware that we were getting the sheep. So we kind of um, changed some of our dormant sprays so that they would not include that um, because of that issue. And I don't remember measuring anything in our forages, but John Kennedy's on this call too. So he could pipe in and correct me for sure. Um, the next question is, what do you mean, or what do you do when sheep cause trunk damage? What preventative action can be taken or what can be done to treat damaged bark? I'll let you go first and then I'll. <laughs> yeah, we, um, we've struggled with this for many years. We have had so many different sizes and shapes of pens uh, between the trees, including the trees to try to keep them off the bark. Uh, and we basically found that if you move them fast enough, um, from one pen to the next and they have enough to eat on the ground, then they don't care about the bark. They will occasionally browse the leaves and the nuts. Um, but, but again, it's really, if they have enough to eat on the ground, then they're fine. I really liked that chart that you made of how you grazed. Um, so we're going in a, around mid-November into the orchards and they will stay through about mid-April. Um, and we're lambing, we, we're switching. They lambed in February and May, and now we're switching our season to lamb in October. Um, and basically they, the first year, something just changed in them in March and bam, they were, they were starting to nibble on trees and that, man, mm. that, that really yeah. um, scared us. So we got them out of that block because it was a, it was a little bit younger block kind of mid midlife. Um, all of the other blocks that were, that were, that were eating, uh, that, that, that were grazing in, they are all older blocks that are towards their end and they do have younger trees, but um, on, we kind of have a north and south. I also like your maps. So if I ever do this again, I'm taking pointers. Um, and so on, on the south side of the ranch that we grazed this past year that had um, lambs on the moms, that group did not bark and they did great. They still had five acre, you know, they still had the same amount of space, but um, didn't have any issues. Our other group that were pregnant it seemed like there were, I don't know, a handful of sheep, a handful of ewes that would bark. And so we tried to, you know, we tried to identify them and take them out. And that that was okay for a while. But then as the season went on, we did have some. So things that we tried to do, we tried to use, um, it was like a clay kind of white paint thing. I don't remember the exact name, but I could look it up for you, Amy. Um, and then... Um, then I tried some essential oils and with mixed in with that. I would put like oregano was the one that, was, and it kind of seemed to work, but it was also labor intensive. My little backpack sprayer would plug up and, um, and then I just was like, it's more important for me to have the sheep out there than to worry about these young, younger trees in a block that's, you know, going to be taken out. But also we're not grazing in young trees. Um, at all. So we just are nervous about that. But um, if you have recommendations, Amy, on things to do, I'm all ears for that. Um, so then the, one of the questions is, are there any frost risks by not, by not mowing your orchard during bloom? We have solid set sprinklers. So we've been safe. Um, and there's really not a lot by by the beginning of February, unless it's been super hot 
it's just, there's just not that much growing yet. It's very low, um, short. The grass is very short. Okay. The, the vegetation is very short. And you use a no-till drill? To we plant do, to yeah. plant our cover crop, yes. We're also not tilling, I didn't say that either, but um, we're on our young trees, we're intentionally planting a cover crop, but on our older blocks, we just let the volunteer vegetation come, which I think in the in one of my pictures, um, you can see it's just beautiful and lush and we haven't, but I am interested in knowing like, is there a better mix for the sheep or, um, anyway. Well, so, that's hot Go ahead. I have to say that's hot off the press. I did, that was part of the forage analysis that we did this spring. Um, the, cause in my research, we left some native vegetation with some plots without the cover crop and the nutritional value is much higher, of course. And um, quantities are much higher in the oh, cover wow. crop. Cool. So yeah, it's definitely well, worth it for the sheep. Now I got to look into that. Um, Deborah asked about the Regenerative Organic Alliance. Um, what you could just let me know what other information you want on that, but it's just another certification certifying agency, so you have to fill out paperwork and um, you know, have an inspection and all that. Um, what, what breed of sheep are you running? Ours are all Dorper. Um, we were going to start with baby doll south downs until we found out how expensive they were um, mm -hmm. because they're so much shorter um, but the dorpers so the dorpers are tall but we did get a few south downs last year and so we're just experimenting to see if having shorter uh, sheep will protect the nuts a little better eat a few eat fewer but the hair having a hair sheep hair breed sheep is is a lot is it saves a lot of time and energy for sure yes so that's what we want to so ours are crosses the the original flock was a cross between a uh, dorper katahdin and romanoff and um just from a short time of observation um the romanoffs are very prolific we've had we've had um, ewes that are having triplets and quads and some of them even had five. It was just- Oh my gosh. Fresh. I mean, it's just a lot, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> but I definitely like the hair sheep. So everything that we are breeding back to is just straight katahdin. Um, and again, I don't want to have to shear either. So that's why we went that way. Um, and yeah, but they, I mean, pros and cons, uh, I, I love our lamb, so it's really, really good. Yeah. Um, is the forage analysis a leaf analysis? Yeah, it was all the, it was all above ground. Um, it was a composite analysis through Dairy One. It's the name of the company. Um, I think I'll jump in here really quick just to make sure we get to all of our speakers. Uh, these are really awesome questions and whatever's not answered, we will definitely um, get back to you with some answers. Just one more to lead into our researcher section for you both. Um, if there is a topic or questions you have that you think would be valuable to have more research on, on a larger scale, um, can you share what that would be? Because we also have a lot of really nice researcher guests here and people that might be interested in helping expand this field. So if there's something that you think would be really useful for you to have some deeper knowledge on and have more research on, please share what that might be. So for me, the biggest thing is the food safety because historically almonds have all been harvested off the ground. But even right now, like I have vegetation under the orchard that the sheep could be eating and I could eliminate basically all of my mowing needs if I could harvest off the ground the problem on almonds would be then how to dry them. So I would like to just have like a five foot wide area that could somehow be sanitized or I don't know. I would like to figure out how to use the sun's energy to dry the almonds, but also not have to um, prep the orchard for like we have been farming almonds, you know, the last 50 years. So how to balance food safety, but using the parameters to still have a safe product. Yeah, I'll second that 100%. It's 
crazy that they can't be out in there 